You may be seated. Good morning. morning. So we're going to wrap up this morning Romans chapter 12. Uh, May I have a joy spending time with you going through this particular chapter of this text. It is probably one of the most uh, singularly convicting passages of Scripture uh, that that I know to just experience. And it's just, it's, it's healthy for the church. It's healthy for us as individual Christians. And so that's why I really wanted to focus on that for a little bit as I've been with you these weeks. Um, so as we wrap this up, as we wrap this, this, uh, this, this series of messages up, I just want to say that what we're going to look at today man, is the essence of why you are still here as a Christian. This is the essence of your, your you have an incredible purpose. You know, we're living in a culture, we're living in a world where, where uh, just naturalism, secularism, you might even say atheism, has convinced people that there is no real purpose in life. That there, there's really not anything that, that for you to live for other than yourself. So, so eat, drink, and be happy because tomorrow you die. And just, just live for all you've got and, and make yourself happy. Don't worry about anybody else. What a ripoff. What, what a lie uh, that, that is, especially as it infiltrates the church, as we talked about a little bit last week. But today we're going to kind of turn our focus outward. Let me refresh you. Let me remind you as, as, we, uh, as we wrap this up that we, we started this, this, uh, this series off looking at our vertical relationship as Christians. Uh, those opening verses, those, actually those two opening verses of Romans chapter 12, that said, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And so we talked about our motivation for living for Christ, our motivation for living uh, this life of, of, uh, of Christian um, sacrifice, of Christian devotion, is, is the mercies of God. And, and the mercies of God are wrapped up in the gospel. They're wrapped up in the cross. And, and I've said this several times. Let me just say it one more time. Man, if I can trust God with my eternal life, I, I ought to be able to trust Him with my temporal life here in this place, right? So that, that just makes sense to me. So we talked about our motivation from those two verses. We talked about our devotion. This is what worship looks like. The surrendering yourself, mind, body, spirit, soul, the soma, uh, the, the body is, is more than just the physical that's talked about in this verse. Surrendering all of who you are, this devotion, it, it, your devotion to God in this way is what worship looks like. This is, this is how we worship God, not just here in this room, but everywhere we are, the way we handle ourselves at work, we, the way we handle ourselves in difficulty, the way we handle ourselves in good times, all of that. And then our lens, we, we need to constantly be shifting our lens away from being conformed to this world, which is so easy to do, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, which brought us into this horizontal view. We started with this vertical view and we moved into a horizontal view. We're going to really extend that today. But as we made that transition, we recognized that uh, uh, living a transformed life requires a new attitude, a, a, re, uh, a renewed attitude, not just a renewed mind, uh, which that, that's the outcome of it, but a renewed attitude, a, a renewed way of, of, of thinking, but a, new, a renewed way of just, just interacting with myself, with the world, with everything. Um, and that authentic love, we talked about this last week, authentic love does not seek self, self-gain, it seeks God's kingdom. And focuses itself outward. And so just to remind you of some of that that we read. I won't read all of that because it's lengthy obviously. Um, but, but beginning in verse 3. Romans 12 said. For through the grace given to me. I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. Here's that horizontal thinking coming in. But to think so, uh, to think so as to have sound judgment. As God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have one member, uh, just as we have many members in one body, our physical bodies, and all members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Since we have gifts that vary according to the grace uh, given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. And then I'll just jump down and read this last verse, uh, the the introductory verse to last to last week, because I think just says it all. Let love be without hypocrisy. We talked about hypocritical love being that inward focused. Love that sounds so natural and right, but is so demonic and, and, uh, and godless. Now, let love be without hypocrisy. Ab- abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. And then today I want to turn our focus on this idea 
uh, the idea that I want us to think about is that your reason for being here, you are a missionary. You are a missionary. No matter where you are, no matter what you do, if you are, if, 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 if you, if hell lost another one and now you are free, what are you free to do? You're free to be a missionary. You're free to represent the kingdom of God on planet Earth to a world that desperately needs to hear about him outside these walls, sometimes inside these walls. But I'm tell you what, less and less all the time are the lost going to come inside here. We used to have a culture of Christianity where even lost people respected and wanted something to do with church. That is long gone. We don't have that anymore. The lost won't come here. We've got to do what the Bible talks about and we've got to go to them. We've got to love them. And so I, as we talk about this, I just want to kind of focus our attention on, on, uh, on a couple things. We'll be in Romans 12, beginning in verse 14 in a minute. And, but, but I'm going to warn you, we're also going to be in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. So just kind of be prepared for that. But I'm going to set some things up. You ready? All right, buckle up. Here we go. <clears throat> so that hypocritical love that we talked about last week, that compassion turned inward, uh, that, that, we, that we just kind of exposed uh, last week. Man, it is the greatest singular weapon that Satan has to stifle the work of making disciples. Love turned inward. Because you see, check this out. Compassion turned inward will never sacrifice self for the sake of the gospel. The consumer Christianity does not inconvenience itself for the lost, and quite honestly, or for the Lord. Yeah, do you know the story of Jim Elliott? Well, you will. Buckle up with me here. That's just a little lengthy, but let me just lay this out. This is going to set up what we're talking about. So as a little boy, Jim Elliott, growing up in Portland, Oregon in the 50s, listened carefully to visiting missionaries at his church. As they told about life on faraway mission fields, he asked them questions and dreamed about being a missionary himself someday. Saddened him that so many people in other countries died without ever knowing Christ, bound for hell. On February 2nd, 1952, Jim Elliott got his dream and he waved goodbye to his parents as his family and uh, a ministry partner named Pete Fleming boarded a ship bound uh, 18 days, an 18 day trip bound from San Pedro, California to Quito, Ecuador in South America. Th their plan was to spend a year in, in Quito learning to speak Spanish. Their hope was to move from there to a place called Shandia a small Kichewan uh, Indian village uh, to take, uh, take the place of a retiring missionary. Jim and Pete studied hard to learn the language and to be able to fit into that culture. Their hard work paid off and in six short months, both were speaking Spanish well enough to make the move. When they arrived to Shandia, they also had to learn the language of the Kichewans. Three years later, so three years after they moved in, into uh, Kichewa, um, <coughs> Many of, many of the native people, the Kichewans in that area, had become faithful Christians. Jim now began to, to think that it was time to reach this other people group close by, this Indian group called the Akas, and tell them about Jesus. The Akas were vicious people. They, they, they weren't cannibalistic, but they were vicious. And, and uh, they had killed many of the Kichewan Indians. They, they killed anyone who came into their culture, they came into their culture. Their, um, jungle. They'd also killed several workers at an oil uh, company uh, where they were drilling for oil there in that territory. The, in fact, the oil company had to close its site because everyone was afraid to work there. Jim knew that the only real way to stop the killing was to see these Aukas come to Christ. And so he set his heart. He had already set his heart there, but he set his heart to do that. So he was joined by some other missionaries as, as, uh, as they poured into this. Uh, Nate Saint, uh, joined them. In fact, there's, there, there they are. There's the five of them. Jim Elliott, Pitt, Pete Fleming. Those are the original two. Nate Saint over here. He's a, he is the pilot. This is just a, such an amazing story. Um, one of my favorite missionary stories, in fact. Um, so Nate Saint was a missionary supply pilot. He came up with a way so ingenious to, to, to fly in circles and lower this bucket down from a plane where the people on the ground could just literally take things out and put things into this bucket as the plane circled up above. It's, it, it's ingenious. It was amazing that he was able to do that. Um, he thought it would be the perfect way to win the trust of the AUKUS. 
without putting anyone in real danger. They began dropping gifts to the Akans. They also used an amplifier, a loudspeaker in the airplane to speak friendly Akan phrases uh, to the natives. Uh, after many months, the Akans even began sending gifts back up in the bucket to the, to, uh, to, to the missionaries. Jim and the others felt that finally it was time to, to, uh, to meet the Akans face to face. So Nate Saint spotted a, a place on the beach right there by the river that, that borders the Aachen um, village, the Aachen area. And so he, 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 it was big enough that he could land his plane there. So he began taking the missionaries one particular day and landing the plane. It was just a two-person two plane. So he'd fly one over there, drop him off. Fly another one over there, drop him off. Finally, he, he, uh, before he landed the plane and stayed there himself, he flew over the Aachen village one more time uh, just announcing over the loudspeaker, just saying several friendly phrases and inviting them to join them at the beach. For a while, nothing was there. Uh, no, no one came, but after, um, after four days, an Aachen man and two women appeared. It was not easy for them to understand each other since the missionaries only knew just a few Aachen phrases. They, they shared a meal with, the, with these three. Uh, Nate uh, even took the man up for a flight in the airplane. I imagine that was amazing for him. Uh, the missionaries tried to show sincere friendship and encouraged them to bring others with them next time. So the missionaries waited for, the, for other Aukens to return uh, for, the two, uh, at, for the next two days, just waiting in their little camp, their makeshift camp, away from their regular camp um, on that beach in a treehouse of all things. Finally, two Aukens women walked out of the, the jungle uh, on, on day six that they've been on this beach. Uh, Jim and Pete, the two original missionaries, excitedly, they ran to the river, jumped into it, began wading over to them. But as they got closer, it was obvious that these two women weren't exactly friendly. Uh, Jim and Pete almost were, were assuming some things here because obviously we weren't there, but, but those were. And you'll hear some things about that in just a minute. Jim and Pete almost immediately heard the terrifying cry behind them. As they turned, they saw a group of Aachen warriors, spears raised in their hands, ready to put them to death. Jim Elliott had a gun in his pocket, but he already decided he would not use it. Actually, each of the missionaries had made a commitment that they would not kill an Aachen Indian who did not know Jesus just to save himself from being killed. That is not hypocritical love. Within seconds, the Aachen warriors threw their spears, killing all the missionaries, Ed McCauley, Roger Udirian, Nate Saint, Pete Fleming, and Jim Elliott. Later that afternoon, back at the main camp there in that area, um, Elizabeth Elliott, Jim's wife, waited by the two-way radio where she would often listen in as Nate Saint and his wife would discuss how things had gone, but there was no call. There was complete radio silence. There was nothing. As evening turned into night, the wives grew worried and they knew that the news would not be good. The next morning, another missionary pilot flew over the beach to look for the men, all he saw was this badly damaged plane on the beach. News quickly spread around the world about five, uh, about the five missing missionaries. The United States search team went out to the beach, found the missionaries' bodies, they buried them. Jim was never able to reach the Aukas for Christ. Never able to do that. Or was he? Jim, Jim wrote this little phrase in his diary before this event happened, obviously. He said this, he says, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. The missionary sacrifice on that beach set the stage for a remarkable, miraculous thing to take place. See, in less than two years, Elizabeth Elliot, Jim's wife, and her daughter Valerie, who was like four or five years old at the time, and Rachel Saint, who is the pilot, Nate Saint's sister, they were able to actually move into the Aachen village. The men who killed her husband, her, her daddy, her brother, were able to live with them. Many Aukas became Christians, so much so that they actually changed their name to a, to a, a, a local word that means people of the truth. They, they, were, they were considered a friendly tribe. Missionaries, including Nate Saint, uh, Nate Saint's son, and, Nate's, and, and, and his family, so Nate's son and grandchildren, continued to live among the Aukas, adopting one of the men 
now a Christian, who had killed the four missionaries on that beach, adopting one of those murderers as his children's grandfather. Only God can write a story like that. Elizabeth Elliot recorded, but I highly read a book. It's a great book called Through the Gates of Splendor. She, she wrote this book. It's been made into a movie. If you don't want to read the book, you can find the movie. Jim Elliot, just look up his life. There's a lot of things about it. But it shows just the real life scenes of the five missionaries on that beach with the friendly Akas, the, the friendly Akas now. It also included footage of the two years she and her daughter spent living with them. And man, I pray that Jim Elliott's message rings out loudly to us this morning. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I'm going to call you to your purpose this morning. Everything that we've been doing in Romans 12 is setting us up for this. To live a life of purpose in this short period of time that we have on this planet. Not for self, but for the kingdom. So Romans 12, beginning in verse 14. You ready? Here we go. Bless those, verse 14, who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not be haughty in your mind. Don't think more of yourself than you ought to. But associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge. Beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But you, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. That almost sounds like revenge, doesn't it? Do not be overcome by evil. Do not be overcome by evil. The evil that exists in your own heart. But instead, overcome evil with good. So this is, this is where we are. This is where our focus is. And now that horizontal, that vertical relationship that translates into a horizontal relationship as we're loving the church. Now we move that. In fact, we see that transition in the last part of what we talked about last week as we move into this, this idea of hospitality, which doesn't just mean inviting people over for a chicken fried steak at your house or something. It means that what we're going to do is I'm going to love the foreigner. I'm going to pursue love of the foreigner. And in that understanding, what it, what, 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 what it means is uh, that I am going to love those who are not part of the family of God. I'm going to love them into the family of God by the grace of God. Hell lost another one and I am free to win one. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, here we go. I, I knew you were there. I, I, knew, I was hoping I wouldn't put you to sleep. So the call, the, the call for us is to be kingdom-focused folks. You know, I think it's awesome that we grow churches. I think I, I'm just excited to see what's going to happen with Somerset Baptist Church as, as, as we just continue. You just continue to honor God and, and just see growth happen and good things happen. I think it's wonderful. But we're not called to grow the church. We're called to advance the kingdom and God grows the church. Right? We're called to fill heaven. And I want to talk to you about that. We're, we're, we're called to fill hell with heaven. Bless those who persecute you. Bless them. Bless and do not curse. This is our call. And listen, this word bless, this has an, this has an eternal uh, uh, ring to it. We are to bless those who don't know Christ. We're to bless them with the gospel. And I'm going to tell you, there's, there's a, I was talking to someone, I think last week or maybe the week before, uh, there's a great book called Street Smarts, which just talks about this idea that, you know, I, I get so intimidated sometimes when I think about sharing the gospel with some people. Yeah, I know I'm, I'm a pastor or I used to be I'm a preacher. I'm supposed to be really confident sharing the gospel with different people. But I'm going to tell you, I get intimidated sometimes sharing the gospel with folks. Some people are harvesters. I've known people in my life who just have the gift of evangelism. They, 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 just, they, they just have the ability to share with anybody. And it just seems like they, they, could, they could give a recipe for French toast, say, come to Jesus at the end, and people get saved. You know, it's just amazing to me. Uh, but, but he's called others of us. Uh, you know, the fields are white in the harvest, you know. Some, 
Some, uh, so, some, some sow, others reap, but all of us rejoice together. Some of us are just called to be cultivators or gardeners. You know, and I, that doesn't mean that we don't never get never get to reap, that we never have the opportunity to share the gospel. But listen, I'm not I'm, I'm not calling you this morning to, to, to memorize the four spiritual laws and to go out there and stand on the uh, table at lunch today and preach the gospel to anyone you know who listens that won't throw you out first. You know, I'm not calling you to do that. What I am calling you to do is live a life, live a life of outward expressed love. Bless those who persecute you in such a way that the love of Christ get spread through you, even when they don't know what's happening. You follow what I'm saying? This is yes, this is no. You with me? Okay, cool. We'll keep on rocking. So, man, this is an out-of-this-world kind of love, but let me tell you something. What is the old saying? I, I think I've said this before in here. Uh, man, we are not of this world. Amen? We're in the world, but not of the world. But make no mistake, we are absolutely here for the world. If you, are, you are here as a Christian sucking air because God, in, God has a purpose for you. And it includes the gospel. It includes the world. It includes the lost. Jesus said, I came to seek and save that which is lost. And I'm going to tell you something. His mission hasn't changed. He's just simply transferred that to us. Go and make disciples of all nations. That, that's, that's our call. That's what we're here for. And can I just tell you? There is nothing more important than eternity. Can you, can, can, can you just grasp that? There is nothing more important than eternity. There is nothing more important than eternity. Not, not your health, not your children's education or well-being. Nothing is more important than eternity. Everyone ever born on this planet, should Jesus tarry, will die. Everyone, myself included. My wife doesn't like me to talk about it, but it's true. Eternity is forever. We'll talk more about that as we as we move along. When I'm talking about us being this, being these, being being missionaries, filling heaven, sharing the gospel, living on purpose, I just want to make a quick distinction. We're we are we're we're to center this in the love of God, right? That, there is an offense to the cross. People are offended by the gospel. There's no question about that. And, and sometimes as I lovingly share the gospel, as I lovingly live for Christ in front of people, people are going to be offended by that. That's not me. That's the gospel. That's the message of hope. I don't ever want to live my life as a way to where I'm offending people in the name of the gospel. That I'm offending them. That I... That I'm just, I know people who just get a lot of joy. I know professing Christians who just get a lot of joy at, 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 uh, at being ridiculed for their faith, at being, having doors proverbially uh, slammed in their face. But we're not to do that. We, we are to lovingly draw people to Christ. That it's going to be offensive to some people, but I shouldn't be. Does that make sense? Yes? No? Okay. Secondly, is this. Look, we're called to be friends of sinners. Jesus was a friend of sinners. We're called to be friends of sinners, but on mission for God. It's different. We're not called to go be partners with sinners, but we're called to be friends of sinners. You know, there used to be sayings like, friends don't let friends, and you fill in the blank. Friends don't let friends root for the cowboys. I think I heard that one time. <laughs> uh, or something like that. Friends don't let friends... You know, eat spam. You know, you know, friends don't let friends go to hell. Amen? So it says this in verse 15. It says, rejoice with those who rejoice. As we focus on into the world, weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Don't be haughty. Don't think of yourself as being better than, than those lost people. But associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men, if possible. So far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. See, see we're to have an open heart towards the world. Not, not open arms of acceptance, but an open heart. It, it, it's not okay what's happening in the world today, especially. Oh my goodness. 
But it's not okay for us to, 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 uh, to just cut the cords and, and not have anything to do with that. All the world needs us today more than it ever has, church. Amen? The world needs the church more today than it has ever needed the, the world. If there's ever a day, it's today. And church, we're the hope of the world. God has not entrusted the message of the gospel with any other entity but the church, the body of Christ. Man, we have a mission. We have a role. And Romans 12, it, it, it culminates with, with just this incredible plan of God to save the world. Not, his plan is not to save Jerry from hell. His plan is to save the world from hell. Are they all going to come? No. But man, we should be we, we, we should be on. We should know our purpose in life. And we should be on. We're to have open hearts towards the world. We're to, we're to pray for those who persecute us. To enter into the joys and sorrows of others. To associate with everyone regardless of their station in life. Regardless of their station in life. Man, what a way to go after the world. I love you. I love you. You know, the whole world thinks that Christians hate them and judge them. You know that, right? That's, there's a reason for that because some of us do. But that's not what we're called to do. Listen, before God's eyes, you are no less a sinner than the worst thing you can think of today. And yet God's response to you was to leave heaven, wrap himself in a placenta, pass through a birth canal, live a perfect life to come get you. That's huge. And we're called to that. Are we doing okay? Romans 12 has some heavy stuff to say. What a way to go after the world. We are to enter into their world. Not being influenced by their world, but we have to go into their world. We have to be missionaries. And, and there was a time, especially in our generation, there was a time that we thought missionaries meant you went to China or you went somewhere else. And this was the happy homeland, right? This was the place where we didn't do missions work. And, and look where it got us, amen? So this was this idea that you go over there and, and you're in danger. You go over there and, and you're in foreign cultures. Listen, today what I'm telling you is the foreign culture is right across the street. And, and we are still called to go into it, not to become it, but to go into it. Where do you put a light bulb? In a dark place, don't you? And, and, and Jesus says he's the light of the world, but he calls us the light of the world in him. Where to go? Where to go? Where to enter into their world, not be influenced by their world, enter into their world with the hope, with, with the hope of sharing the deep, deep love of God for them, for them. This should be our passionate drive. Paul put it this way, right? In 1 Corinthians 9, you don't have to turn there. But in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul said this, listen, I become all things to all people. Uh, right? He said, um, to the weak I become weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men, so that I might by all means save some of them. I can do all things. Or rather, I do all things for the sake of the gospel. Everything that I do is for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker in it. He say, I, man, what an amazing reality. I get to partner with God in the sharing of the gospel in the world around us. What an incredible reality. Can you think of anything more purpose-laden than that the God of the universe would invite you to partner with him to take the gospel to a community that is opposed to him? Can you think of anything more rewarding, more purpose-laden? Can, can, can you? That was not entirely rhetorical, but sometimes silence is the way we respond. We're, we're, on, we're to be on mission with God, a friend of sinners. We're also, though, we're, we're, it's, it, it's painful sometimes to be in that world, to be ridiculed all the time, to be put down, to even, to even be hurt, to even, be, to even be, have a spirit thrust through your chest, Right? But what, what are we to do with that? Well, we're to trust God with our hurts. We, we trust God with the places that we've been hurt and we extend help. We become wounded healers. We, we, we trust God where we've been hurt and we extend help to a hurting world. He says, never take 
uh, your own revenge in verse 19. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. And I just want to interject this. Understand that it's not God's desire that any should perish. So it's not God's heartbeat. It's not God's desire to inflict wrath on your behalf. But leave, leave room for the wrath of God. If, if all you're doing is getting vengeance for your own stuff, you, I, I don't get mad, I get even. If that's your, if, if that's your mantra, I, I, you know, no one walks on me. I, I take care of my stuff. If that's your mantra, that's fine. Watch God just back away and let you just handle your own stuff. But leave room for the wrath of God and watch God do the most amazing things. Yes, sometimes judgment will fall on those who have opposed you. But miraculously, Sometimes the very, the very things that happen to you, God will use those things to humble this other person to the point that they come to Christ. I can't think of a better form of revenge than to see an enemy become a friend who loves me. Vengeance is mine, God says. I will repay. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. On his head. Listen, we need to trust God. We need to trust God with the things that happen in our life. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes they come out of left field. Sometimes uh, I, I went to lunch with this young guy over here earlier this week, and we we, we, we go to the, the, the National Hamburger Joint of the South Side, Griff's. Hey, anybody know Griff's? Okay. And, and uh, backs the truck in, and we're just talking to each other, laughing a little bit. And uh, I get out of the truck, and there's this this guy with with uh, with with a lot of tattoos, uh, walking across the parking lot, uh, carrying a, a, a little truck dolly, a little, that little square thing with wheels on it, under his arm, just walking along. Um, probably, probably partly my fault, I just, I can't help it, I, I like to make eye contact. I get out, I'm smiling, I'm laughing, I look at him, I, I, I'm just about to nod, and, and homeboy says, what are you laughing at? I don't know how to handle that sometimes, you know? But you got to trust God with that. I said, I'm just smiling, bro. You know, I, I, I should have said something profound. Like, oh, Jesus loves you. I, I, but I didn't. I can't even make it up because I had a witness who yeah. sitting in the room go against me. Right? So we got to trust God. We know that God is all powerful. We know that God is all knowing. Nothing surprises him. And God deeply loves you. Listen, in Christ, you're going to be okay. Yeah? It's, it's okay. You're going to be all right. In Christ, you're going to be okay. And so what's this whole thing about heaping burning coals on, on somebody's head? What, what's, 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 the, what's the deal with that? You know? Um, but honestly, um, it's kind of a difficult thing to understand. But Hebrew culture, this, this phrase, heaping burning coals on someone's head, it, it, it's kind of an axiom, kind of an idiom. That, that means that you, your behavior may bring shame to the other person. Your behavior may bring humility to the other person. Your behavior may bring, dare I say it, repentance to the other person. If you think about uh, Old Testament prophets who would sit with ash, uh, sackcloth and ashes on their heads. This is, this is where that comes from. A place of repentance, a place of shame, a place of, of, uh, of contrition. And so the idea is that your behavior may just be the thing. The way that you respond may just be the thing that causes someone else to repent and trust God with their lives. Do good to those who hate you because they are deeply loved by God. Do you know that? There is no one that you know that is not deeply loved by God. I heard a story told by some young men at a camp that I was at one time uh, talking about one of their adult counselors. Uh, the story, as they're, as they're sharing it, this is kind of, as I remember it, I wrote it down, but um, we were saying at camp one summer, um, we were teenagers, you know, obviously, and we were admiring this man, and, and one of the group began telling us that his daughter had been brutally murdered by a young man the family had taken into their home in an attempt to help him. Amazingly, this man, this man murdered his daughter. But amazingly, he repeatedly went to the prison where this man was to minister to his daughter's murder, finally leading him to Christ and continued to visit him over the years. Christian man was also just a master of loving the world. 
The boys, I remember they would say, you know, no wonder we felt Christ's presence through this man. The love of Christ had become his master. And so finally, as we kind of move towards the end of this, what I'm calling you to do is to live, live life cross-eyed, right? I'm being going to play on words there. Just keep the cross in your eye. But I've been set free that the love of God compels, or, or rather the, the mercy of God is my motivation. The gospel is my motivation. Um, do not be overcome by evil, verse 21 says. Live with a cross-eyed view. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Hell lost another one, and I'm free. If we're not careful, that can become a very convoluted, inward-focused uh, song of worship, song of praise. We have to be careful with that. I'm free to what? I'm free to live as a missionary. I'm free to live on purpose. I, I'm, I'm free to live on mission with God. I, I, I'm not going to be a spiritual glutton turning my faith inward. I, I'm, I'm not going to be a Christian consumer. Just, just give me, give me, give me. I'm going to storm the gates of hell with the gospel. So the hell loses another one and another one and another one. Amen. Turn your attention real quickly as we wrap up to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to make you go ahead and turn there if you want to. Although we're not going to spend very much time here. I'm just going to set you up for homework if you want it. Right. Uh, verse 11 says this. Therefore, this is our role. This is our call, y'all. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, men and women, knowing the fear of the Lord. Knowing, knowing the goodness of God, the, the, the awesomeness of God, we persuade men. We, we, we persuade them to what? Well, jump down to verse 14. It says this. Listen, the love of Christ, the, the love that's been shown to me, the love of Christ compels me. It drives me. It, the love of Christ compels us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they might live no longer to themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, now we no longer, uh, not now, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet we know him that way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. New things have come. I know what time it is, but I seem to unpack that really, really quickly. Uh, from now on, I know no one according to the flesh. Listen, nothing is more important than eternity. And every person sitting in this room is eternal. Every person that you're going to meet on the street is eternal. Some young man with a, with a, a truck dolly giving you a hard time at grips is, is eternal. They are going to live forever. There, ne there was a time they didn't exist, but there will never be a time that they don't exist. You have never met a mere mortal, C.S. Lewis said. But, but every man, every woman that you have ever met, we must see them as, 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 as eternal beings. Something's going to live forever. And only the gospel determines where. Only the gospel determines where. And the truth in verse, 15, uh, in verse 16 uh, no, 17, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, listen, if anyone is in Christ, and, and we often say, think this is about me. You know, if anyone, I need to start living better because if anyone's in Christ, I'm a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, everything's become new. But that's not what he's saying. Listen, we need to look at people as though they are eternal beings and, and understand this. The minute that one comes to Christ, there is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, everything has become new. You have the ability, it's amazing to me, to cooperate with God in, in seeing someone's eternal destiny revolutionized. You have that opportunity. Not if you turn love inward. That will never work. Not if you're not focused on, on, on the mercies of God and placing yourself on the altar of God. That will never work. But when we turn the, the love of God, which has been poured out onto us, outward into the church, which is the hope of the world, and then into the world around us, which are the lost who we're called to reach, Man, what a difference we can make as the body of Christ. It's not the preacher. It's us. It's you. It's me. It's all of us. Now, all these things are from God, he goes on to say, who reconciled us 
to himself through Christ. That might remind you of some Sunday night stuff. Reconciliation, not just forgiveness. Who reconciled us to Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Not counting their trespasses against us. And listen to this. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore... We are ambassadors, not of the United States, not of this world, but we are ambassadors for Christ. It's as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And here's the, here's the, here's the nut of the gospel. Verse 21. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So I'm just going to call you that he is no fool <clears throat> who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. <clears throat> You're saved. Those of you who know Christ, I'm assuming that's most of you in this service. You're saved. You're going to heaven. What a joy. What a joy. But you're not just sa saved to sit here. We are saved to make disciples place ourselves on the altar. We love the church. We commit ourselves to the body of Christ. And then the body of Christ individually and corporately, we go save the world. We have a mission. We have a purpose. It's greater than you could ever imagine. And I pray that you get on board with it. The gospel is this, right? God loves you. He created you for himself. Yet our sin separates us from God and places us under the right wrath of God. There's nothing we could ever do to, to, to remedy that. It's hopeless except that God loves us. And God did, therefore, what we're not able to do. God left heaven, wrapped himself in flesh, lived a perfect life in our place to give us his righteousness, died in our place to pay for our sin, and then invites anyone whosoever will, as they hear the gospel, to respond in faith and put their trust in Christ. I'm assuming most of you know that message. I wonder if you're willing to get on a plane, so to speak, Risk a spear in your gut in order to, to, to heap burning coals on the heads of those who need to repent at the news of the gospel. Can God use your life? Would you give him that freedom? It seems weird to talk about God that way. Would you give him that freedom to use your life to make a difference in the world around you? Not just a preacher, not just a Sunday school teacher, but you are the hope of the world as the body of Christ. Father, we love you.